Hello and welcome to Any Combo Lords joining me today where I'm going to begin by setting up a few nuts in the background for any potential squirrels who may join us because, you know, the squirrels of this new generation here in the combo class are quite playful. They've been uh, much more amicable, much more sociable in ways to humans than their parents or grandparents or whoever the previous squirrels were. These new ones have been getting fed nuts by people growing to trust the humans, and I still believe that one day we'll be able to get a shot where I'm teaching a math lesson on my desk here while I have a miniature desk of sorts with a nut on it and a squirrel is simultaneously teaching a nut cracking tutorial for any squirrel viewers. <laughs> In any case, we're going to put up a few nuts just to make sure that we motivate any squirrels to stop by. I also got to uh, reset up any clocks that fell due to wind. Sometimes it gets windy back here in the combo classroom and all of the clocks that have been set up in our upper zone have fallen. And this one's already prone to fall. Let's see. Now we'll put a few nuts for the squirrels as well. Like I said, because I want to give them a little encouragement to visit the combo classroom. I'm not going to hurt the squirrels. I'll be a friend to them. I will encourage and congratulate them on joining us in our combo journeys. Somebody asked if squirrels gives uh, eat raisins. I'm not sure if they do or not. I've looked up that they like unsalted nuts. There was already a squirrel back there. Could you see that? There's, he ran by really fast. They're scared of my voice sometimes when I talk too loud. So they run by if I'm talking too loud. And then when I like stop the stream and I'm quiet for a minute editing something back here, a bunch will show up. As soon as I'm not do, doing the episode, they'll show up more. But we get a bunch in the episodes. We got a squirrel in the last episode eating a uh it, well, it wasn't necessarily eating the nut in the shot but in the last main combo class episode then make sure you've all caught remember this is more of my bonus channel my more of my playground channel despite having more subscribers due to shorts the combo class channel is really where my best episodes go including one i put out about two days ago about pythagorean triples and quadruples the first part of a two-parter of sorts where the next episode coming out in slightly under a week on that channel will be about Fermat's last theorem. And today I put this thing called Diophantine equations in the title because that links these two concepts. They're both examples of what we can call this uh, Diophantine, Diophantine. I'm sure I'm going to pronounce it wrong. Everyone pronounces it different when I hear it. Diophantine is how I'm going with equations. So both of these, as well as other things we've talked about that are number theory concepts, can be described under this bigger bridge that I thought we'd discuss a little bit in today's stream in and around our squirrels and other fun facts to kind of bridge the last main combo class episode regarding Pythagorean triples and quadruples, which is linked in the description. So if anyone hasn't caught that, watch that after you leave the stream and uh, the next episode about Fermat's last theorem. Basically, Pythagorean triples tell us, in, most people see them as what are integer sides to a right triangle, or because of the Pythagorean theorem, what are three integers where a squared plus b squared equals c squared. But there's so many other ways to see them, so definitely watch the last episode if any of these following quick facts don't make sense to you. Pythagorean triples also describe diagonals of rectangles. Pythagorean triples also describe integer coordinates on circles with integer radii. Pythagorean triples also describe points on the unit circle with rational coordinates. Pythagorean quadruples are a thing. Pythagorean quadruples also describe 
three-dimensional versions of some of those things we said in 2D things. And if any of those aren't automatically intuitive to you, then feel free to watch the episode I put out a few days ago where we go into some of those refreshers, a little less of an episode that's purely, I doubt anybody has heard this cool fact I need to share, and a little more of a, my better version of what many teachers teach, P Pythagorean triples. And I still think that even people who know this concept, many of you will not know some of the applications we dive into in the episode. Next episode, we'll take it even further because Fermat's last theorem asks about out, not which two squares can add to another square, but could you have two cubes that add to another cube, two fourth powers that add to another fourth power, or two of any higher than second power that's the same power add to another of that same power? Like two whole numbers to the fifth power that add together to another fifth power, or so on. Well, that's been proven impossible, but the story of how it was proven impossible is quite interesting. That is the first half of next episode, and the second half will dive deeper into what questions remain beyond that. But I thought today in our stream, one of our topics might as well be taking a look at some general looks at what does it mean to be a Diophantine equation that is an overall number theory term that sort of links these two topics? Although I forget if that, I don't think that term made it into the edit of the last episode. I'm not sure if it will make it into the edit of the next episode. Uh, I might as well mention it on this channel as a Diophantine equation can be a term in number theory for a particular, often polynomial type equation, a bunch of uh, basically variables that are like letters to different powers, usually to a whole number power, added and or subtracted together to equal. You could make them equal to zero if you add subtraction, because you could either say, I only use addition and I put the terms on both sides, or I use subtraction and I have it all equal zero. These are called Diophantine equations, and technically the term could describe really looking for integer and sometimes rational, meaning a fraction type of two integer solutions to simple equations like that. And you could even think of like a to the first power plus b to the first power equals c to the first power as in a way a Diophantine equation, but a very trivial one because we know that for any a and b, multiplication is closed under the integers and we're going to get another integer. And so, or in that case, addition being closed, but things like that are trivial, but you can have less trivial ones as well. Now I'm going to jump into pulling up my computer screen to look at a few examples of these Diophantine equations. Like I said, uh, the last episode is part of, what the hell? What was that? I didn't see that as well as you folks. Probably I was facing this way. Clock just fell or something. This clock just this clock just fall and break or something? Hear that shattering noise? Okay. Uh, I think this clock fell and helped further break a different clock that was already partially broken. Yeah. Okay. Like I said, the wind sometimes makes clocks fall. What can I do? Now, I'm going to take a peek at our comments first before we jump into pulling open a few examples of Diophantine equations to link that last episode, our next one, and other topics that a lot of people who stumble into this channel like number theory because a lot of the facts that hooked a particular person that I said were secretly a Diophantine equation, were secretly if I say, oh, these are the only numbers that, you know, are a factorial that's one more than a square, I could call that, or it's something like that, uh, more often the other way around, squares that are one more than a factorial, but stuff like that 
can be secretly described as Diophantine equations. What are integer solutions to n factorial plus one equals m squared? And we'll assume if we say Diophantine equation here that we're looking at integer solutions, but sometimes a lot of them can be shrunk or expanded to include rational things, like how Pythagorean triples, you could take the three, four, five triple, and not only is three squared plus four squared five squared, but three fifths squared plus four fifths squared equals five fifths, which is one squared. So you can shrink and grow some of them. So sometimes rational solutions describe the integer ones as well. Other times they don't, but you still want to know all the rational solutions as opposed to irrational solutions. A lot of the concepts we've named in fun facts in our videos could be translated into Diophantine equations. Those of course would be more boring uh, to say in the uh, video or whatever. Sometimes we'll try and clarify it like in a main episode, but in a short, you know, it's not going to be as much of a hook to say which integer solutions fulfill n squared or n factorial plus one equals m squared. As to say, what are the only numbers known that are a square number one more than a factorial? But a lot of those fun facts we can reverse translate back into the Diophantine equation that let me know what fun fact was clear to say. You'll notice some of my videos I'll say, this is the only things. Others I'll say, this is the only known things. Others I'll say, uh, even clearer, these are the only known solutions up to a particular range has been checked. Well, those relate to me looking up what usually could be called Diophantine equations. So let me look at our chat real quick, and then I'm going to pull open a few examples I have here of that. Somebody asked if squirrels can... Somebody said, I still make math equations nice. Uh, I do make all sorts of math. Don't worry. I mean, if you watch my Combo Class channel, which is my main channel, I put out an episode there about two days ago. I have been a little sparser on my content the past week or two, but remember in general that this is my playground channel and that you're more likely to get pure math in content on my combo class channel. And this channel will be where I end up putting my various random hobbies, whether I have a cool plant or animal to show you folks, or I have a particular game that I'm analyzing, the game theory of, things like that. For example, later in this stream, I might talk more about this old game theory thing related to an old game I used to be hooked on that's still arguably the most popular card game in the world called Magic the Gathering that I re-looked into the number theory of. I don't intend on buying any of the cards and you gotta be careful if you you know, get hooked on buying any pieces of cardboardy plastic. I haven't, haven't bought anything like that in years. But the game theory of it's very interesting as far as not only the designers trying to design a game that is impossible to break too easily, they don't want to ban very many cards from a format without them causing too easy of a deck assembly that makes that deck always win. And also the game theory from players. Like, I was looking last night while I was falling asleep, honestly. This is just an example of a random hobby that I have in between my main topics that will show up on this channel at times. Is I was looking at assembling certain decks of certain sizes under certain rules. How many of a certain magic card can I include in a deck? Under how many deck total size do I have and such? that would let you win a certain percentage of the time on, say, the first term or whatever. Or first turn. <laughs> I'm saying term because I'm so used to these. Uh, I have the Diophantine equation thing ready to go. So first term? No, no, no. no. First turn. So uh, things like that uh, as far as uh, 
random hobbies of mine, like a card game we might talk later as far as very mathematical game theory, but in the reference of a card game, as if we were talking about game theory through chess or such. As well as my music I'm going to put out someday and my books I'm going to put out someday will all end up on this more playground channel. I'm even going to just start putting all my shorts on this channel because they hit so harder on this channel. And this channel will probably maintain the lead on my main combo class channel in terms of subscribers. But I don't care. I can have my channel where I put out my full educational or philosophical video essays. And this channel where I try my experiments, which usually work pretty well. This is approximately five-fourths of a year since I posted any combo class footage anywhere online. So, that's pretty good and quick. Now, wait, wait, no, a little more than that, but, um, well, let's see. When was the first combo class footage? It's, um... We'll look back into that in a bit, but it has not been long that we've been putting out combo class footage on this stuff. And I think it might be, yeah, five fourths of a year since I put any combo class footage online. Because, yeah. So, hmm? So, Five-fourths of a year that any combo class footage has been online. So, we, we got a good start on whatever's happening. YouTube wants me to play all these weird games where you do a channel on a certain amount of schedule and you have the same video length and same schedule and stuff. That's what the algorithm motivates. But, I don't care. We're going to do what we want to do and it's worked so far. I have important things to teach, both in math and other philosophical and natural things. And I think you'll enjoy having fun with me on our bonus stuff on the channel. So uh, we'll just let the algorithm like us or dislike us. Hopefully they'll like us enough. Now, as far as some other comments on here, somebody said a cooking stream is a top priority. So... That's something I can do if you want more cooking streams. Well, I do like cooking food. I'm not even the biggest, like, eater as far as I will. I don't eat out very much because I'm very hesitant about spending money. I also live somewhere with kind of expensive food in the Bay Area, so I don't eat out very much. I try and cook a lot, so I've learned some cooking hacks and such. I'm not like a big foodie or whatever, but it's kind of cool to learn some certain cooking things. And one of the combo class episodes that's going to come out, it's going to be the next combo class main episode is the Fermat's Theorem one I mentioned. Then it's going to go to either a number theory one or like another number theory one. Or to, in some order, another number theory one I won't spoil. And a snack break, which is, so somewhere from two to three episodes from now will be a snack break episode, which I've been filming for. And I have, let me in a minute go grab some props that I have for that snack break. Because maybe we'll even take a bite of a strange snack to maybe I'll even put the footage in the snack break. I don't know. We're still filming some interesting snack footage around here with some, this is the type of thing that I've included my main camera guy, Carlo, in some footage, and I might include some friends or random stuff. It, it's a snack break episode, but it's an important one. It's gonna be about surprisingly edible peels and what I call the edible peel conspiracy. How they're, they don't give enough information and education when they sell you certain foods that some of them, if or when it would be helpful or necessary, the peel is fully edible. Now, maybe some of these hacks are only to use on a desert island. Maybe some of them you want to try because you might actually appreciate it. In any case, don't copy any of what I do. 
Uh, I'll make a disclaimer in the episode too. You're going to see me eating a lot of weird foods. So don't, uh, disclaimer will be in the episode too, but don't copy it because your food could look different. You could have a weird allergy. There could be something random that goes wrong that I don't want you to sue me over. Just don't copy whatever I do, but I'm going to eat a lot of strange edible peels in one of the upcoming snack breaks to show you the edible peel conspiracy. So many more peels are edible than you folks realized. And I actually uh, was filming that yesterday and still have some props, meaning fruits, around. And by that type of prop, they're props that you got to be careful enough around because you hope to eat them after you use them for filming. So maybe I'll bring some props, meaning fruits, around in a moment and we'll look at uh, if we want to get any bonus footage on stream of uh, me eating any surprisingly edible peels. That'll be coming in a few episodes. Now, a lot of great comments around here. Thank you all for your random thoughts. And somebody said, why don't I devote this as my main channel? Well, this channel just has more subscribers because of the shorts. It doesn't, the YouTube algorithms are very weird. I personally, if we're just talking about personal goals, I like having a channel that is more my polished off edited stuff and a channel that is more casual and freeform this being the more freeform one. And as far as a YouTube perspective, they care about the different algorithms differently right now. They're going to change it in the future. Everything's going to change. They've changed how it looks at various points in the past and how it works for people. But if I put a short on the other channel, it won't do good. But if I put a main video on this channel, it won't do good necessarily. They're like queued up to different algorithms almost. The other channel, the algorithm likes me more in terms of a horizontal normal video. This channel, it likes it a lot more for shorts and probably even likes it more for live streams. Even though we don't get a ton of viewers on the live streams, you'd probably get like none on the other channel because their algorithms are very weird. So... We will, um, we'll see what we do in the future as far as what content we put on which channel. But this channel, I have from Combo Class in the title now to let people know where, that it's connected and stuff. But it, this eventually will probably just be called Demotro. And that one's called Combo Class. And that's like my show. And this one's like the guy who makes the show other stuff. And so... I don't know. We'll see what we do as far as what we put on which channel. But right now, as far as we have it, this is where extra stuff goes. And since to me, shorts are extra stuff and to YouTube, shorts are worth promoting like crazy. This channel does better. But whatever, I do see the shorts as extra stuff. I don't see those as a full learning or laughing experience. I see those as a mini taste of something, but I don't watch shorts much on my own. I film more shorts than I watch. And so it, it's uh, those, as long as YouTube is obsessed with showing shorts to people, this channel will probably do better because a lot of shorts will end up on this channel because I see them as more bonus content. Now, let's see. Uh, there's random weird comments to square root of 64. I know you're young, but don't make comments that are racist or weird. That's like a sort of weird stereotype sort of comment. So uh, just don't be don't make weird stereotypes or you're not going to be welcome here. And to everyone else, welcome to Magic Fellow, one of our main combo lords and moderators. Somebody asked for a house tour and I'll do that at some point, but I, so here's the thing, we can do a classroom tour, but uh, I live, this is in my parents' backyard. I don't have my own place. Someday we'll have a combo castle in the woods maybe, but 
I'll need to get my family's like permission to do a house tour because I don't have a house. I have barely any money. This is all built in a little corner in my family's backyard. But when my family's down, I'll at least uh, feature my family on stuff or do tours of part of the house. Let's see. So, a lot of good comments. And what we will look at in the future here is a few of the more common, interesting Diophantine equations. I do want to grab those fruits in a minute, but let's do this bit first. So, these are some Wikipedia examples of what they consider the most common. As usual, a lot of people don't like Wikipedia, but these are things that are checkable or non-checkable. I can look on another source if they're right that this is called a linear Diophantine equation or not. So I'm not going to quote this in my episode or a paper I write, but it's usually right on math stuff, so it's a great encyclopedia. Not a great research article, a great encyclopedia. And it's interesting to see what they sometimes put when they're forced to pick the top of a certain thing. Like, what examples of Diophantine equations have not only been submitted on this page, but have gone through all the editors, and all the editors decided these are the six that are worth keeping and not kicking off the examples page right here. Well, you got a linear Diophantine equation for this example. Well, my point with that is just Wikipedia is underrated. I'm going to make an, a video about it sometime. Uh, you can trust my episodes more than Wikipedia, but most content you watch, you can't. And people trust a lot of content. And so it's just like people underrate Wikipedia. It's if you're trusting almost anything you read online, why not trust Wikipedia? It's highly more checked than all the other stuff that you trust. If you are very limited and you only trust research papers and published books and such, then OK, uh, that's OK. If you want to be really picky and you want to say, I only trust research papers, I only trust uh, published books, then maybe you don't want Wikipedia. But I don't think that describes most of you, does it? Have you ever believed a fact that you read on Facebook, Reddit, Instagram, Twitter, any of those? You know, Wikipedia is highly more checked than those. So do double check it if we ever look up a fact on Wikipedia and you're going to put it in a paper or have it really, really matter to you know that Wikipedia is a higher percentage of likelihood of being correct than something you read on, say, Facebook or Reddit or Instagram or Twitter, but, or even on YouTube. No, hopefully not my channel. Hopefully my channel I have maintained being uh, more accurate than even this standard, but on the average YouTube channel, you know, this is Wikipedia is way more accurate than the average YouTube channel. So people underrate it. With that said, these are double checkable things. Those are the best things to look up on here. What are their examples of Diophantine equations? A linear one where if we have something like when can 3A plus 7B equal another C, where those are all whole numbers. Another one here is having two cubes add to another two cubes. Now, one of these famous cases was the great mathematician Ramanujan, uh, because he was just a super crazily deep in his head about these math formulas guy who invented the coolest math formulas. He's one of my favorite mathematicians. And he just happened, people overrate the fact, but I really like the anecdote because there's a lot of numbers that fit this. The fact is that 1729, which has other cool facts too, happens to be the smallest number that you can add two positive numbers cubed to get another two positive numbers cubed. Now, 
the fun fact is the anecdote about like Ramanujan, like meeting somebody in a different country because he was foreign and coming to, I believe, somewhere like uh, Britain. I'm not positive and meeting some other more like formal mathematicians when he was sort of self-trained to much of his brilliant knowledge. And he happened to know when he mentioned to someone, he's like, oh, your taxi cab number 1729. That's not boring. That's the most interest. That's a very interesting number. It's the smallest number. That's the smallest sum of two separate cubes. Now, what's actually most interesting about this is not the fact that he happened to be adding up which numbers can be the sum of two different cubes. He was looking for near misses to Fermat's last theorem. He believed Fermat's last theorem was probably true, not definitely, because it hadn't been proven yet. And it said that you probably, at that point, now proven definitely, can't have a cubed plus b cubed equals c cubed on its own as whole numbers. And so he was looking for near misses. The reason you call this a near miss is because one cubed is one. And this says that 12 cubed is one off from being nine cubed plus 10 cubed. And so it's like, we almost got Fermat's last theorem. I added two cubes and it was one under another cube. He was looking for near misses to that. And that was actually why he randomly knew this fact. So that's a cool little anecdote, more than a fact about the number. And we're going to be looking at how Fermat's last theorem doesn't, uh, is proven impossible, or Fermat's last theorem was proven true in that it's impossible to have this be zero cubed and these be any whole numbers. You need some other thing there. Here we see the case that we were discussing, infinitely many solutions of Pythagorean triples. And when you get bigger than two, then you're no longer possible. And Fermat's last theorem shows it's not possible. That's weird that they say it's proven in 1995. That might have been the latest edit on it or something. The first presentation on this paper was in 1993, and most of the edits they needed to make were in 1994. So I would mostly say this was proven in 1994, so I'm not sure why they say 1995. Maybe they had like one extra edit there or whatever. They do have a source, so you can see right here. You know, maybe that was the latest edit he had to make on the paper to make it fully airtight. Now, here we see Pell's equation, which we haven't, you know, some of the fun facts we've done have secretly been this, but we haven't explicitly called any of them Pell's equation or have maybe one of my shorts mentioned this term. I think one of my shorts might have mentioned this term. And so... Pell's equation basically relates to when can two, a square and a multiple of a square be one apart in a way and a little more variable like this sort of. So here the Erdős Strauss conjecture is one that we'll probably mention at some point, and this almost made it into next episode. Next episode had so many cool ones to mention. This shows up in it. So this we don't even need to talk about. This will be in the next main combo class episode with more details. And the next main combo class episode is also to a degree about this one. Um, Pell, Pell's equation will go into, or Pell equations will go into, further in the future, as well as someday we'll talk about the Erdős Strauss conjecture because that didn't quite make it into the next episode, but it's pretty cool. It says, I don't believe it's been proven. And it says that for any N greater than two, you can find other whole numbers that do this. And 
the easier they describe it much simpler here four over n can be written as the sum of three positive unit fractions now Thank you to everybody who has joined us. These are a few of the classic Diophantine equations, and one that I want to talk about later in the episode. Somebody mentioned in a reply to a comment on, one of, on the last main combo class episode, which is linked in the description, about this thing called Euler bricks that are pretty cool. And I realized that I'm going to, at some point, have the right context for these to fit into an episode, but they didn't happen to fit into the last episode, and I don't know if they're going to fit into the upcoming one. I've mostly filmed the upcoming one, so less likely I'll add a scene related to these. Maybe I'll give them a little cut scene, but or a title card or something. More likely they're not going to get a main feature in next episode, but the Euler brick is... A cool unsolved question in number theory that I do love that I figured we, we might as well mention in the stream before we get, you know, too wrapped up in all the other Diophantine equations I'll need to talk about. And then I'll feel like we've talked about too much number theory for a minute and switch topics for a minute. And then I'll feel like, whoa, we never talked about the Euler brick. So, of course, named after Euler, I'm just going to start saying the greatest mathematician of all time. I often addend or amend or append or whatever that statement with that he's a personal favorite or that he is commonly considered the best. But he is so commonly considered the best that I feel like it's a uh, almost inoffensive statement to just say that he is, by most objective standards, you cannot assign objectivity to this, but by any ob attempt of objectifying how good a mathematician is under standards, he is the best. That he is considered the best by so many people and has so many things named after him and more and more things that I find interesting. I will look up and find that they were built on some foundation he set up many, many years ago. Euler was, I believe, the 1700s. When was he? He was, yeah, alive in 1707 to 1783. Now, the Euler brick is a particular cuboid. And let's see if I happen to have any bricks around. Well, you know what? Maybe we got some bricks. I have more bricks, but last time I stocked more bricks next to a computer, it was a joke that ended up in it smashing the computer. And it would be pretty, uh, under Pretty badly ironic if I actually recreate that gag with a functional computer instead of the prop, at that point, prop computer that was already broken. Man, everyone got so offended in the comments when, not everyone, you know, of course, the loud minority is the one who likes to talk, but like, surprisingly, 5% of the comments were very offended about uh, me having smashed a computer or damaged technology. It's like, come on, bro. Do I look rich enough to be smashing a functional computer? Yeah, the computer that was smashed in that was obviously already broken. It did. You never saw the screen lit up. I dropped it into a bucket of water. It was <laughs> so. Uh, everyone got so mad about me breaking a prop for the sake of. A, comedy, B, attracting random attention to an educational topic that, what am I going to do? But it would be poorly ironic if I actually set up bricks and then broke a functional computer, the one I'm streaming on right now in the process, so let's avoid that. Now, 
maybe it's because I'm, I'm clumsy and set up my classroom in a way that makes other things genuinely break once in a while that people assumed I had somehow genuinely broken the computer. But watch the beginning of the binary episode or a uh, balanced ternary episode sometime on my channel where you'll uh, come on, folks, you've got to be uh, you watch too much media if you believe that that opening scene by the time you see my computer fall into a perfectly placed bucket of water was just typical clumsiness. Now, somebody said the near miss is from the Simpsons. Now, I think they're referring to the near miss right here. They're referring to something else. So, Simpsons put another near miss that was a funny gag in their episode. I'll say that in a moment. However, to say the near miss is from The Simpsons, yo, you know Ramanujan was around a little bit before The Simpsons. Ramanujan was around, you know, more than 50 years before The Simpsons started. So... <laughs> What was Ramanujan? He was, uh, yeah, late 1800s to early 1920s. And so uh, the, the near miss is not from The Simpsons. The near miss is from Ramanujan, a great Indian mathematician who was alive before The Simpsons and who also died before The Simpsons started. But uh, The Simpsons separately, I think I know what you are referring to. Separately, The Simpsons put a pretty epic prank on mathematicians in one of their episodes where they put a really large cube equals another really large cube equals another really large cube on some like black billboard or whiteboard or blackboard or whatever. And they're such big cubes that it's hard for the average computer program to do those correctly. And they were pretty close. They were like in the right ballpark. Like, you know, the cubes were, I don't know, within a thousand of each other or whatever. Uh, so it was like a really big version of a near miss. Like there's like a, you know, a decent discrepancy. I don't know, like a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 off or something. But the cubes are so big that most computers didn't pick up that discrepancy. So they had like a near, near miss. Maybe, a, I don't know, someone comment if they know the size of the near miss when they did that. But the reason I know that is because uh, I, some people may have seen that in a video that the great channel Mathologer did where sort of like how I work my geeky hobbies like dice or card games or board games or things like that into my theory that I want to talk about to present other things. The Mathologer guy sometimes works in like weird TV shows or movies or stuff. He also wrote a book that I own that I think I might have first read the Simpsons thing in that he wrote a book about all of the weird math that well done or poorly done in movies and TV shows. It's a pretty old book, but still really good. Now, thank you to everybody who is sticking around with random stuff right here. And yeah, so this is, I guess somebody commented what it is. I wonder if Wolfram Alpha would be able to compute that if somebody wants to see how far it's actually off, how close of a near miss it is now that computers are better. When they designed that episode, it was harder to get a good computer for easy online or somewhere easy like that. So, or like to do that on a basic calculator. I bet now it's a lot easier to calculate that it's a near miss and not a solution, but pretty good prank by the Simpsons people to stick that in there and make anybody who had a not that accurate calculator check it and be like, wait, what? Does this disprove Fermat's last theorem? So, 
Funny when having not that good of a calculator could get you pretty off. There's a point where pi goes to six nines in a row, not that deep into it, where if you were the first one calculating pi and your calculator rounded or something, you're seeing just like only nines and or round to a bunch of point zero 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 zero, and you're like, whoa. Is pi like rational? Did I get to a point in the decimal where it's just zeros after that or just nines after that? Which would mean it's a rational number. So careful when your calculator is wrong. If you had a really old school calculator, you might think that pi equaled 22 sevenths or square root of 31 or other classic ones like that. Now, the reason I got bricks out was not to accidentally recreate that scene from the episode. It was to discuss this thing called the Euler brick, where imagine this is a brick of any dimensions I want. By brick, I mean what can be called a cuboid, and it is basically a cubic prism. So if you imagine, often people call it a rectangular prism. So basically like a cube, but my three dimensions, although they are perfectly perpendicular to each other and rectangular like, they can be different amounts than each other. Here, maybe I would estimate that this is like a one to 2.5 to six ratio. I don't know, to five, uh, some, you know, different ratio of the sides. If I scaled this up with the right unit, I could maybe say this, maybe this is a three by five by 12 prism or something like that. But the other traits that mathematicians might wonder is which prisms have their face diagonals be a whole number? If you have them scaled up to some size where these are whole numbers, which you can't do that with any prism. If one of these is irrational, and you scale it up to a whole number, then it's going to send the whole number ones up to irrational, unless they're all irrational in the exact same way. So you can scale it up in a rational way if you have rational side lengths to get these to whole numbers. But when will the diagonals be whole numbers? Well, like if I had, if this was three and that was four, that would be five any of these diagonals on that face would be five. Same with that side of the cuboid, because it's a cuboid rectangular prism thing, you know, three, four, five. But then let's say I needed five by something. So let's maybe say I go five by 12. So let's say this, let's say it's a three by five by 12. This will be a cool example because, no, 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 uh, that doesn't quite work. I want three by four, but, uh, whatever. I wanted it to be five, but that was coming off there. But if this was four, then we would need a Pythagorean triple that lined up with that. And so if you had somehow the right faces for Pythagorean triples, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, that could be your faces. You could maybe make a prism that also tried to have some of the diagonals be whole numbers. And maybe you could even try and make the hyperdiagonal a whole number. Because the hyperdiagonal, like I show in the main combo class episode linked in the description, the newest one out, is describing what's called a Pythagorean quadruple. A squared plus B squared plus C squared equals D squared. And so, can we find sets where we can get a cubic prism of sorts, rectangular prism of sorts, and where we can get all of these diagonals, and maybe we could even try and get our hyperdiagonal to do it. If our hyperdiagonal would do it, then that's what they're calling perfect cuboid here, where if we have A, B, C are our side lengths, and those are whole numbers. D is the diagonal whenever we have a B and A side. 
E is the diagonal whenever we have a B or no, a C and A side. And F is the diagonal whenever we have a B and C side. And G is the hyper diagonal all the way through it in a 3D way. Well, now we need to have A, B, and C are whole numbers. A squared plus B squared equals the square of a whole number. A squared plus C squared equals the square of a whole number. B squared plus C squared equals the square of a whole number. And A squared plus B squared plus C squared equals the square of a whole number. Watch my latest episode if you want to see exactly why that makes sense. But with the perfect cuboid, they don't have one yet, haven't found one. So all they know is that if a perfect cuboid exists, because they've checked a lot of lower stuff, there's a mix of checking stuff and proving stuff, the odd edge must be greater than this. The smallest edge must be greater than this. The diagonal must be greater than that. And other facts that must be satisfied by a primitive one, which would be if you find a bigger one, it could be a scaled up or down version, perhaps, of a smaller one. Sort of like how you have primitive Pythagorean triples that can be scaled up or down into, well, only up into other triples. And here we have facts about what a primitive one has. Look at all these crazy facts they know about if you find a perfect cuboid. It must fulfill all of these. Now, some people describe even an Euler brick as being like that because the Euler brick, here they're calling it a perfect Euler brick. It would be one where the 3D diagonal, they're using mixed up terminology in this article a little bit. Here they say perfect Euler brick, here they say perfect cuboid down there and stuff. Um, oh no, here they go. Also called a perfect Euler brick. Okay. So where that one they don't know, as far as an Euler brick that the 3D diagonal doesn't work, but all of the face diagonals are whole numbers, are known. These are the five primitive ones with dimensions under a thousand. So like if you have this brick, let's see which one looks closest to the brick. We'll say it's closest to this one here. If this is 160 millimeters, obviously it's not exactly, let's just pretend. 160 millimeters, 231 millimeters, and 792 millimeters, then these would diagonally have these whole numbers as well. However, it wouldn't have the 3D diagonal. So it's not what they call the perfect cuboid or perfect Euler brick. So that is one of the fun, simple geometric open questions in number theory that's really easy to visualize. Maybe I will even need to throw in a title card or cutscene about this into the next episode because the next episode about Fermat's Lax theorem and things like that goes into a lot of algebraic open questions. And while the perfect Euler brick is sort of a whole series of algebraic conditions that must exist at the same time, you must have these three existent at the same time for a normal one. And you also need this existent for where? You also need this existent for the type they don't know if it exists yet. So it's a series of a bunch of little Diophantine equations that must be true at the same time. But it's so easy to geometrically visualize that it makes it on the list of classic open unsolved questions in number theory. I mean, not the list. There should be a the list. Someday we'll have a better the list of classic unsolved questions in number theory. Um, Paul Erdish, whose name came up a little earlier, tried some stuff like that, as well as other people like David Hilbert and people to formalize all the questions that we had to open. We'll look at some lists of the great questions that were asked in the past because 
A good one that's really underrated that we're going to need to look at sometime is Hilbert's questions. He had somewhere around, David Hilbert had about 20 or so questions that he posed to the mathematical community in the year 1900. And these were the inspiration in many ways for the millennium problems that were now posed with a million dollar bounty that are seven problems that one has been solved out of seven that have a million dollar bounty on them by the Clay Institute of Mathematics. And those were in many ways inspired by David Hilbert, as well as other lists that came out in the year 2000 that were inspired by the list that David Hilbert put out in 1900 that contained somewhere around 20 open questions. And if you look through the list, it's very interesting to see which have been solved or unsolved or things like that. For a moment, let me, just for like a sneak preview, let me see um, what they have to say about that here on our simple Wikipedia. Hilbert's problems, do they have an article about that? Yes, they do. Cool. So, 23 problems that he published in 1900. He presented certain ones at a conference and then he published a complete list a few years later, uh, over the next few years. Now, some of these are still unsolved and massive and huge. For example, if you look at um, the eighth, the Riemann hypothesis, this also, this is the only one that, not only is it my favorite of the millennium problems worth a million dollars and one that we will make an episode about before too long, but it's the only one, I think, that was both on Hilbert's list and on the millennium list. It was unsolved from 1900 and important enough to reiterate the question with a million dollar bounty 100 years later. But in 1900, he still considered the Riemann hypothesis worth noting on his list of problems. Others of these are very important in number theory as well. And if you look through the results here, they color code them. They say green are the ones that are solved and then the yellow are either too vague or semi-solved or ambiguous to whether they're considered solved, and then the red are fully unsolved. Now, and then I guess gray are vague ones or something. Gray, he stated a question that based on our current mathematical framework, it's not a singular question. Now, these are great and very interesting. Some that we are going to definitely talk about is the continuum hypothesis, the Riemann hypothesis, the Gelfand-Schneider theorem that can illustrate an answer to this one, And a lot of these things like this is straight up like Diophantian equation number theory territory on a few of these express a non-negative rational function as quotient of sums of squares. It's about functions, not numbers, but still. Now, calculus of variations is really cool. I love that. We'll talk about that more. So. These are very uh, iconic problems that were posed in the past, and we're going to look more about those over the future. I might make a whole episode dedicated to them at some point, because while I want to make an episode dedicated to the Millennium Problems, that's, you know, got to be a great thumbnail and title right off the bat. These seven problems are each worth a million dollars. In fact, I have found other problems that each are worth at least a million dollars. There are nine problems I have found that are worth a million dollars. The seven millennium problems, a foreign prize on the Colatz conjecture, and the Beal conjecture. Now, one has been solved, so theoretically out of those nine million dollars, eight million dollars are available. So, that will be 
you know, right off the bat when I want to make that episode, obviously that will be an easy to click episode for people and probably do well. But I'm sure there's already episodes on YouTube and articles and all. I have a whole book about it, about the millennium problems. You don't hear enough credit for Hilbert's problems, the predecessor. And this mathematician, David Hilbert, was really cool. He, some sources say that more than almost any other mathematician, did he seem to understand almost everything that was going on in math, which seemed like, and even more so nowadays, an impossible task where you must almost be a specialist, know about certain categories and not others. David Hilbert somehow had this extensive range of understanding, this huge scope of what was already massive at the time. He also invented some fun particular things. We'll certainly see the Hilbert curve at some point. His name will definitely come back in that. Now, thank you to everybody joining me for our little chat about Diophantine equations, number theory, and random things like that. As I take a quick break in a moment, um, first somebody says suggest a cool wall watch. You mean like a clock, like a wall, like a, like this new clock I got, like how I always got new clocks if you ever ask me about a clock. Um, a cool clock. Well, we're going to do an episode before long. This is one of the many topics I've come up with recently that I was going to make a bonus video about. And I was like, nah, I want to make a whole episode about this. I'll spend an extra month on it and turn to a whole episode. One of those is how to make the better clock. And what we're going to look at in how to make the better clock. Uh, well, this is a cool idea is you have different, you know, items, but they didn't really do numerically very well on this. They didn't have a corresponding item. I like if maybe you have one of a thing, two of a thing, three of a thing, and so on. Maybe for 12, you have a 12 pack of eggs. Maybe for, you know, exactly, little items that represent an amount of things. But I will say that in our episode where we'll do that before too long about how to make the better clock, we'll ponder if you did have numbers on your clock, what if you included some of them being negative numbers? What if you included some of them being fractions? What weirder, better options could you have for your clocks? Well, I think I'd be the guy to know something about that, am I right? So, I'm going to run inside and grab not only just quick water and bathroom break, but also grab a few fruits that are related to a snack break episode coming up. And if anybody wants to guess which fruits have a surprisingly edible peel that I might have been eating recently, that may be a few of the props that I have to, if I eat them in the stream, I'll be eating the peel. So I'm, it's either going to be not eat the things I bring out or eat them in a chaotic peel eating way. But guess what is a surprisingly edible peel that you think that not that many people know is edible, but that secretly more people should know about. Now, I'll be back in a little bit. So I'll be back within less than five minutes and bring a few fruits and such. In case any squirrels come, we'll point the camera a little more upward because we did put some nuts there and I'll grab even a few more to restock with a few extra plentiful new nuts to make sure if any squirrels are lurking around the neighborhood, despite the chaos my voice may bring, maybe they will come and gather some food from us. Okay, I'll be back soon and I love you all.
Hello and welcome back. Thank you to everybody joining me again. I just had to stop by to not only, you know, once an hour or so in our stream, run inside to grab some water and use the bathroom and such, but get some rare fruits. And I also brought some stuff for the squirrels. I brought them some nuts. So we're going to restock. I don't know if any of them came to get any of the nuts we already put. But I'm going to put some a little higher up this time. Because the squirrels sometimes might only see the ones that are really high up. And then they can come try and get lured down into our main zone. Now, I found out that one of my neighbors actually has this little thing they set out for the squirrels. Like a miniature picnic table of sorts where they put out whole unshelled walnuts for the squirrels. And it makes sense because we've seen in earlier streams walnut shells. I was like, some neighbor must be giving these squirrels walnuts. They don't look like, I think a fresh walnut off a tree does not look as exactly dried and shaped like the walnut you buy in a store. It looked like a store walnut these squirrels had. And so I was wondering, where are they getting these whole walnuts? In fact, you can see one in the last episode. It's, uh, I won't pull it up now because I'm, I'm almost positive it made the cut of the last episode somewhere in the midpoint of the last main combo class episode when you see the squirrel cameo, look in its mouth. There is a whole walnut in there. And I also got a extra good squirrel cameo I'll tell you about in a minute with these. But uh, the squirrels are getting extra friendly with people now that the neighbor is putting out these squirrel, these nuts for them every morning. And I'm so down with it. I want the squirrels to love humans. I want them to come around here, climb all over me. I want a squirrel on my head. I want a squirrel in my coat. There's going to be squirrels everywhere once we get these squirrels knowing that humans can be nice to the squirrels. However, there are actually some public squirrels who are a little too accustomed to eating food from strangers. If you feed a wild animal like that, you don't want to give it a bunch of junk food because it might like it and then flock to you extra friendly like, but not able to hunt on its own or learn any of these things. And so, it's good to give them something like a nut or something out of their straight up diet and then they're going to keep looking for nuts in trees when they're done eating the nuts I have to put out for them. So you got to look up what the given animal wants. Now speaking of which, we're going to have a cool bird feeder upgrade at some point. I haven't had the time to upgrade that yet, but uh, one of our awesome fans, uh, George, sent me on the private mailbox we have for people to send me random stuff, which I haven't checked in the past week or two, and I will be back to again soon to see what new trinkets may have been sent by any combo lords, uh, that uh, we got this upgrade for a bird feeder that will be extra smart and cool that we're going to install in the future. Now, uh, yes, this bird feeder does not have any seed in it. The bottom fell off. Part, uh, half the time I knock it off, half the time the squirrels knock it off. I can't even keep track of if it was me or the squirrel the last time who did this one. But uh, <laughs> uh, this bird feeder didn't work. It's partially that it's really cheap and flimsy, partially that it's too close to the range where I bumble around and set up whiteboards that it kept hitting it. The new bird feeder we are going to put on a higher perch of a tree somewhere perhaps like up on that perch or something like that, where we will uh, not bump it when I'm moving around lab whiteboards and things like that. Now, that'll be fun. I also have a friend, like I mentioned once, who knows a bit about birds and who thinks that if he comes over sometime, which I'll feature him on a stream to do this perhaps, he can identify, based on the bird sound, what birds are hanging around here and in the front yard and such. What are the species of bird that visit here? So that'd be pretty cool, have a birdologist or whatever you call it, ornitholo- I don't know what it's called, to come over here, investigate some of our bird noises and bird sightings, and line them up with the actual species. Now, you know we like weird little species of things, but I'm not a botanist as much as a mathematician or other sorts of 
you know, creative or investigative person. So I don't know the species. Well, it's not even a botanist. What do you even call it? An animal, a zoologist. So that's how less of it I am. I called it a botanist by accident. I'm not a zoologist. I don't know if that's even what it's called. Uh, I don't even know what type of subspecies or whatever the squirrels are, which particular species their name would be. I don't know what types of birds we have to any degree. I tried to look up the cats I have. And if you look up a little bit of info about my cats, you can find the closest that you can get. So if you look up a thing called a Bombay cat, this looks sort of like my cat Sage. So same with the stray sassafras who we adopted. They look kind of like this type a bit. And they have a little white, well, no, only Sagey does. He has a bigger version of that white patch. Sage, who's perfect, but he needs a vet checkup because he has a little spot on his back. So I'm going to have a vet come for him. But he's perfect and awesome. He looks like this one, but a little bigger, but he has a white spot. But the funny thing is that it turns out cats can have multiple dads in the same litter of one mom. Sounds kind of crazy. Don't know how to say this in a kid-friendly way, so we'll just leave it at that. Can have multiple dads in the same litter that one mom gives birth to. Now, the... With that said, my other cat, Dandelion, does not look like that. He has the same white spot as Sage. He was adopted as baby tiny twins with Sage. They are known to be twins. But twins with a cat can mean they have the same mom and different dads. And I think that might be the case with Dandelion, because a different type of cat that looks more like my Dandysaur is when you look up a Norwegian forest cat or something like that. Now, Norwegian forest cat, these are different colors than my Dandysaur, so i got to look up a black Norwegian forest cat. And this is more what Dandelion... Uh-oh, what have I done to myself? Okay. This is more like what dandelion looks like. These look like dandelion. This looks like dandelion. So, they look, these look like dandelion. Oh, you guys, you guys who know dandelion, doesn't these look like dandelion? Oh, I love dandelion so much. I love all of them so much. I love sage too. And I love sassafras. He's the new one. But I think they might have like different dads as twins or something because that they have the same markings, but one of them is that fluffy style, one of them is that silky style. So I tried to look up the cats. I don't know if anyone ever wants to pay to get a genetics test on the cats. I think it's possible. I can't afford it right now. If anyone ever wants to make a weird donation just for the purpose of having me pay for a genetics test for Sage and Dandelion, we'll do it. Now, answering some more comments here. Welcome to all of our great combo lords. Somebody asked, what do I think about the number zero? Awesome, probably best number if you allow it in the mix. If you allow zero, but you don't allow infinity, which although they have similarities, is often a trait of number systems to allow zero and not infinity. That zero, best number, coolest number. I, I usually think it's too powerful to even mention or can't even get on the list. Zero trumps all numbers. So it's too cool. But that's why if people ask my favorite number, I'm usually like, you know, well, we have to discount zero, one, I, negative one, pi, all these way too classic numbers. We got to, you know, say the most underrated number or something, for example, which is six. But zero is actually the best number. You know, six pales in comparison to what zero can do. Now, to whoever asked about what I think about three, six, and nine, 
I believe that those are very great numbers. You know, I like them because I like three-even numbers. Of course, I like even numbers as well. And, you know, if you like even numbers, three-even numbers, and primes, you like most of the small numbers. But <laughs> with numbers like that, three, six, and nine... I feel like there's an implication they've been given based on this strange thing that people associate with the old scientist Tesla, who really liked this pattern they did in base 10. And I think that I'm hesitant to say that three, six, and nine as a trio have, you know, any more importance than put 12 in the mix, put 15 in the mix. Three of the numbers, great. 3, 6, and 9, well, these cycles relate to the fact that we're in a base that's one higher than 3 squ squared, or 3 times 3, and so our base is 10, one higher than 3 threes. So 3, 6, and 9 do funny things because they're related to the number one less than our base. And so th if... There are certain traits 3, 6, and 9 do that just are completely coincidental by the fact that we count in tens. We don't have to count in tens, not idealized or better. If, if we counted in base 6 or 12, two highly better bases than base 10, we, sixes and threes and nines wouldn't have the mystical patterns, which seem mystical because they're simple enough to understand, but not quite enough sim simple enough to be obvious. Whereas the patterns that an even number in base 10 seem too obvious, you know, they end in the same digit every time, things like that. Multiples of five, is too, especially multiples of 10, those are way too obvious of patterns to seem interesting. But really the mystical ones sometimes are just people not knowing enough about what B minus one does. And in our case, B minus one, base number minus one is nine, has the factors three, co-prime with six, also has nine. And so, I mean, not co-prime with six, shares factor with six, also has nine. So three, six, nine gets a little too much credit as a trio due to our base. So nothing stops with the threevens being cool at nine. You can go on to 12. 12 would be far more sensible to include in the mix. Caps off a lot of those patterns in a great way. So three, six, and nine are both underrated and overrated depending how you look at them. Someone said three, six, nine mafia. Yeah, I... 3-6 Mafia is a actually cool rap group. I haven't listened to them in a while, but they're a classic, underrated 90s rap group, 3-6 Mafia, that were one of the originators of the triplet flow, which was a predecessor to that flow getting popularized by the artist The Migos, who I also like a lot, but are often seen as the originators of that particular way of flowing a rap verse that really they, I think they would admit inspiration to probably, uh, or maybe they stumbled into it on their own because it's a simple idea, uh, was originated as a popular thing with 3-6 Mafia. So we will actually go into that at some point. We'll do an episode someday or a bonus video about the triplet flow. I think rap flows are very interesting, as well as rhyme patterns and things like that. Now, somebody said base 120 is really good at fractions. Now, let's remember that while 120, it has a lot of digits, so it'll be hard to look at all the fractions, but it is a really great underrated number. Its main traits of factors will relate to being good at twos, threes, and fives. Base 120, fraction-wise, wouldn't achieve that much that base 30 wouldn't. Because base 30 also ha is able to process twos, threes, and fives. By process, I mean it can do things like fractions in a non-repeating way. That's one you know, trait of a base able to process one of its factors is that 
a fraction composed of just multiples of the or just powers of those in the denominator will be not infinite in the base. It'll have a representation that caps off at a certain point. And so base 120, while I love 120, wouldn't achieve that much fraction wise that base 30 or 60 wouldn't necessarily, because they might take a few more digits, but you know, the digits mean different things depending on how many symbols you let yourself have. They might take a few more digits, but as far as repeating versus non-repeating seems to be a pretty big trait. And 120 would have similar repeatability to base 30 as far as which fractions it could process. So still, um, very cool because 120 oh somebody also is pointing out that it would be better at 11s randomly because 120 is one less than 11 squared and the number one more than your base gets some cool traits so if one if 11 squared was one more than your base that would give 11 some good traits 11 of a thing not the number that meet that is written one one in the base but 11 of a thing and some other ones. So, I'm not sure why 120 would necessarily be good at sevenths, would it? Base 120 sevenths, because, is it because 119? What are the factors of 119? Yeah, so. That has a 7 in it. You're right. So 7, 17. So yeah, 120 would be cool for the, that reason. I'll look deeper into that 120 stuff uh, at some point when I have time. And it would be good because of the number 1 under it does have 7 and 17. So that's a good point. I do... While I think it would be too many characters for a human to use in a base, 120 different symbols per digit, and to have almost any number we ever worked with just be one digit, it almost it gets rid of a lot of the patterns that numbers have when they all are expressible as their own one digit thing, all the numbers up to 119. But while I think that's the case, I do like the idea of it. I will look further into it because 120 is an underrated number. I've said in a bunch of episodes and stuff, long hundred, one of the terms you need to be more familiar with. They used to call 120 hundred in certain cultures, and then it evolved into, oh, we can't call that 100. The number 100 gets to be called 100. 120, you have to be called long 100. And then people forgot about even calling it long 100 and gave up on it. So long 100, 120, great term to bring back, great number. I'll look further into the base. And if you're the one who left some posts about base 120 somewhere related to combo class, I will look into those as well. Uh, I haven't had time for that, but will certainly be interested in those. All right. Now, I think it is too many digit symbols for a human. I don't think we need that many digit symbols. I think it would be way more efficient if we were in base six. I think we could lose some digit symbols. Seven's gone, eight's nine. These are all gone as far as like appearance of a digit. Goes one, two, three, four, five, and one zero for six and so on. I think that would be better. If anything, base 12 is a good alternative, if not base six. I can't imagine going all the way to base 30, which is really efficient in its own ways. So with, I can't imagine going all the way to 120 or something with having that many different digit symbols. Already, one example I have is that 
the English language has 26 letters and it doesn't even use all the 26 right. It gets confusing of overlapping some of the same sounds some of them cover. And while it doesn't do it ideally, you could have 26 particular sounds for letters. Even if you made every sound that would be used in a language, you'd have less than 100 different sounds. And so like most languages don't need a hundred different sounds, they need ways to combine the sounds. And so I think math is sometimes like that, where it doesn't always help to look at 120 different single digit things between zero and 119. And then like to look at two digit patterns, you're describing massive numbers. So I think even base six, is okay. I, I would recommend going the other way, honestly, but I will look into those things about base 120 because I love 120. So out of all the higher bases, it will be certainly one of the ones I will consider. Out of any base, it's 120 is the only base higher than 100 I will consider. So we'll look into that one for sure. Now, Thank you all for joining me. As far as what I brought out for humans, not counting the nuts I brought out for the squirrels, I have some bananas, which technically, yes, the peel is edible. It's not ideal. Do not copy any of this. There'll be a disclaimer in the main episode I make about edible peels soon and such. But the peel is technically edible on bananas. It dries out your mouth a lot. Also, there used to be this weird myth that if you, like, smoke the banana peel, you, like, get high or something. Highly doubt that's true. Not related to eating the banana peel. It's just an actual factual thing that you can technically chew down the banana peel. It's not poisonous in any way. It'll probably hurt your stomach if you eat a whole banana's peel. But who's to say? Maybe you got a strong stomach. It, the thing about the banana peels, though, is it dries out your mouth like crazy. This is one of the ones I'm less likely to do in the stream because if I just, like, take a chomp out of this, it maybe I'm mildly allergic to it or maybe it's just what it does, but it's so dry. It's not like how dry it tastes. It tastes like a normal texture, but it, like, dries out your mouth. Then you get your other weirdly edible peels, such as your citrus. Now here we have, funny enough, in terms of size, we have our lime, our orange, and then our lemon. Debatable which of these is even bigger. I think the lemon is bigger than the orange. Not everyone's used to them like that, but we got some good lemon trees. I think this was from our lemon tree in the yard I share with some neighbors. Now, so it's sort of a wimpy orange, sort of a good bulky lemon. So we crossed the typical size threshold. You usually expect your orange to be bigger than your lemon, but here we go. But technically all of these have edible peels. The thing is the lemon is by far the best. So we'll go into a more thorough listing in a minute, but I wanted to bring these out because I left them out there from some earlier filming. Also to show you guys a little prequel of wondering, hmm, maybe we will rank and discuss strange fruits tasteability of rare peels before long in a bonus snack break. And also because if anyone really suggests, we could theoretically film some bonus footage of eating one of these. But if you really are curious about seeing me take a bite out of a given one of these, Leave a comment about the specific one that you're very curious about seeing the peel get eaten. And we have the fruits. <laughs> and yes, I have a backup one to actually film more with in case we destroy any during the stream. I got two copies of each of these. Well, I have both of my copies of the banana right here, but I have two copies of each. Now, these will show up in an episode before long. We are going to do another number theory one or two first. 
and then compile these. We have a very great cameo from my main camera guy, Carlo, in that one, which I won't spoil what happens, but something related to edible peels. We got a, we got a good Carlo cameo in there. And lots of fun comments. Now, um, as far as what else we're going to discuss in this stream, I think maybe we'll test one of these. So if anyone has a preference, leave it in a minute, but I'm going to test one of these because I'm worried once I eat into one of these, it's going to draw. There's flies that have been coming around partially from when the potato plants were going up or from maybe the fruit antics that have been happening recently. I don't want the flies to come around. So leave a comment if you have a preference of which one. You would like to see a snack break in our stream today. And the rest of them, we'll have to wait to see a more thorough ranking of later. I will say I have eaten many wild lemons in the past. I have less experience with the limes and oranges the lemons I have, I've eaten three lemons in a row for a challenge once with the peels. So the one that I think we'll try since somebody mentioned it is oranges, unless anybody has another crucial suggestion. Somebody also mentioned grapefruit. Now, when I looked up grapefruit, it looked like very rarely, but occasionally people are allergic to the grapefruit skin. And it seems less common than a lot of things, not very common at all. And it might only be that those people were on a medication that reacted with the grapefruit, because strangely, certain medications I've been on in the past have asked me not to take grapefruit while I was on that medication. It happens with weird medications for random reasons. But... For some reason, some people have had problems with grapefruit skin in the past for some reasons. So I skipped that one just in case I'm weirdly allergic or anything. But it should be edible for most people. The same was true when I looked up mango skin. Seemed like most people can eat it, but there's a small chance you're allergic to mango skin. I don't know if that just means the same people who are allergic to mango, which I'm not. But I skip mango skin in it as well. Maybe we'll try that sometime later once we've gotten our EpiPen ready to get ready for our shellfish tutorial. Since I'm allergic to some sorts of shellfish and I'm not sure exactly which, if it's just crustaceans or not. So we're going to someday do an episode where I have a friend who knows a little bit about medical things with an EpiPen ready to help me eat a bunch of seafood throughout the day of different sorts, building toward the crustacean, past the mollusks and other sorts of things, and seeing if I'm allergic to which ones at which point. Sounds dangerous, a little bit dangerous, but you have a reverse tolerance to those things, so... I'll explain more about that later. Now, for now, we'll just try a little bit of the orange, which may, I don't know which of these is more grapefruit-esque if we're looking for a grapefruit, which we don't have on the table here. There's also a lot of weird combo fruits. There's these really big lemons that grow on my neighbor's tree. And there I've had very large lemons before. Okay, I'm gonna pull open a secret Okay, no, no, no. okay, I'll put this in the next snack break. In the snack break, I'm going to put some flashbacks when we do our edible peels because not only do I have to show the time I ate multiple lemons with the peels, but I also will probably have to show the time that me and my friends ate a lemon that was literally bigger than my head from a neighbor's tree. Literally bigger than my head. And it was an absurd lemon. It was mostly peel, and then it had this, like, lemony stuff. And then it had like a hollow center with juice in it that was absurdly acidic and like burnt you like battery acid. It was like the sourest lemon I've ever tasted. And it was like this big. So I'll have to put footage of that as well in the next snack break. We'll do that then. 
Now, here is, we'll just try a little bite of the orange as a test just to show the possibility as a little prequel. Technically edible. I can eat the peel. Adds a little bit of bitterness, but also adds, in a way, some, like, almost blandness, but in a good way. Like, you know, when you have a sandwich, in your sandwich, you don't want just meat and cheese and stuff. The, the bread and lettuce and tomato and stuff, a little almost blandness that balances out that stronger flavor portion is useful. Well... The orange, I kind of feel that way about. It's a little bitter. But I really feel that way about the lemon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. genuinely good so you like sour candy or something you want a natural sour candy well lemons pretty much always the peel is edible and it balances it out in a crazy way the outside yellow part you may know as zest that they put in some recipes has a slight acidicness and a slight bitterness to it then you get your inside that is mostly sour and on a good lemon sweet as well. Then you get your white part. That's like the bread of the sandwich. You know, who wants to eat a sandwich with just meat and cheese? You need your bread. So it's like if the lemon inside was like some really good sandwich filling Maybe you'd underrate that on its own until you saw, oh, what if I put it with some bread and a little bit of like mustard on the bread? All I'm saying is that edible peels can be underrated. And we're going to look into not only the citrus tier list, but maybe not an official tier list, but essentially which citrus I recommend or don't, but some weirder experiments. I'm not going to say which fruit I ate the peel of yesterday, but yesterday I ate the peel of a pretty crazy fruit you'll see the footage of later. Somebody said a back view from the camera. Do you mean the other direction of here? We've done that before. You get to see that when I try and pan over to catch a squirrel or whatever. But... Now, my goal was to bite these so I could move them and not attract any flies, but now there's lemon juice all over the table, and that's probably going to attract more flies than the fruit itself. So I'm going to get a little napkin or towel or something in a second, but what was I thinking about here? The back view, sure. You can get a back view. So if you mean this direction, yeah. But yeah, you get to see that sometimes when we have to catch a squirrel or something in the other angle. It's also a rare little corridor. Back there, there are some loquats. I can see if there's any left. Oh, I got the cute, that's what I was gonna say about the squirrel in something like these. So one fruit that you can eat the peel of that not everyone does is this thing called loquats that happen to grow over there. I, can, I need to check in a minute if there's still any ones left on the tree or if they all passed their time. Now, the loquats, the squirrels have been getting them and, like, leaving them around. They leave them up on the staghorn fern sometimes. And they snack on a loquat and leave the remains around here. And I eat the loquats, too. They're good. I don't know if the squirrels eat the peels. I don't think they follow my peel-eating advice on the loquats. They're like me. I don't always eat the peel on the stuff. It's not always the most flavorful. You just throw in a bite here and there. But with the loquat, that's probably what they're like. They bite in. They don't care if they get a little peel. Then they might peel around it to get the best part. 
and I got a really cute clip of a squirrel eating a loquat. So I'm gonna find a way to put that in the snack break. The cutest clip ever of this squirrel just like, nye, 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 just eating a loquat. So, let me um, grab a napkin so I can wipe up all the fruit juice that just spilled from eating this. Uh, and, okay, we'll do one more bite of each as a combo. Mm -hmm. It's good. Now, let me clean this up and then we'll get back to one or two more fun mathematical and philosophical and natural topics before we wrap up. To anybody who has to leave early um, before I come back in like three minutes, do... Uh, make sure you've seen the main combo class episode, the latest one that is linked in the description here related to Pythagorean triples and quadruples and such. And let's get a good squirrel angle just in case any squirrels come. And I'll be back in a minute or two. I'm going to clean up this mess right here and then I'm going to talk about a few other fun topics. And from there, if you have to go early, make sure you've seen that episode and the next one that will be coming out before long on there too. All right, I'll be back shortly. All right, folks, I need to dispose of these still, but once I clean up our zone here, we'll have a few more random fun topics. Thank you to everybody joining us for our combo bonus. I want to say live stream of the week, but I usually end up doing more than one a week. At some point before long, I am going to start 
trying to make my live streams more of an official fun little live show by having some assistance on the camera and stuff because while I'm running every part of the scene between the tech aspects like keeping the computer plugged in and facing the right direction and the camera on the streaming software showing the right window and stuff and being a presenter self it's hard to run all the aspects of the show when we get our chaotic live streams when we get our uncut three hours in a row or whatever it often becomes so uh remember that soon before oh god what's that a clock before long we will uh try i think it's just a budget issue that I'm not usually able to do this, but I might have just enough budget to sometimes um, hire one of my camera people, such as Carlo, to stay afterward and help me run a live stream as a more fun, efficient, cool series of topics. Now, thank you all for joining me in our chaotic-ish grade negative two continuation of our show still growing out from the dirt surprisingly quickly now i know our live streams are a bit chaotic but that's why we at least have our combo class channel with our slightly more edited stuff and i will work with some more editors over time so that our bonus content on here can catch up to that at times as well now um to whoever's wondering what I'm cleaning up, uh, it was these fruits that I chomped into. I'm going to finish them later, but I need to move them somewhere else so that I don't make flies want to come back to the classroom. The flies came back here for like a week because something about the potato plants that were growing. So I took out the potato plants and the flies stopped. For some reason, they really liked those. But then I realized that under where the dead potato plants were, Potatoes grew. I don't know if you all saw this stream before, but I need a potatologist or something because some of these little potatoes in here that uh, I'm kind of disconnecting some of these from their roots, so I hope they're good, but some, these already feel pretty disconnected. I put in a few bigger potatoes. For example, this. Uh, wait, no, this one's still connected. I won't show it, but the ones I put in are like older and rotten ones. When I checked back, there's all these newer looking little potatoes. This one I'm not positive about, but like these little ones. I did not drop that in there. That must have grown somehow, but it's been so quick. What about this one? I definitely didn't drop this one in there. I did not put a potato that small into there. I didn't have a potato that small. This must have grown in there. It's a potato. So I need a potatologist to help confirm. Am I allowed to cook one of these on the next live stream and eat it and not die? Because if I can safely eat these, I will cook these on the next live stream. We grew potatoes, baby. That's awesome. Oh my God. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. That's so cool. That's so cool and weird. Okay, you can see one of the potatoes I put in there growing the new little potatoes right off it. Look at this. This is a potato that I had put in there. Can you see that? Look at that. That side of it is an old rotten potato. This side of it are new potatoes growing right off it. I didn't know they grew that close to the old one. That is so crazy. I need to film that closer later. Oh, I'm gonna like destroy this by bumping everything. Oh, I'm accidentally gonna like hit stop streaming or something. But I need to film that later in the actual camera because that is absolutely crazy. It just, I don't want to rip it out because it's still connected with some soil to the other parts. But that's like literally, you can see an old, I'm going to put some soil over it for now. We'll give it a little burying for now. An old potato growing the new ones right off it. 
I didn't know they grew right off it like that. So, if anybody has your own space in your yard, you could try dropping a potato in some good soil and it might even just do its own thing and take care of its own growth. However, be warned that the potato greens and potential fruits they could grow are poisonous. If I make fruits off a potato plant off one of these experiments, it will be poisonous and not to be eaten. Potatoes, we eat the tubers, the roots at the bottom, but we don't actually eat the fruits or greens of them. Why? Because they're poisonous. They're part of the nightshade family. And although tomatoes and eggplants and things like that are also in the nightshade family, those are a few exceptions to the rule that usually nightshades are poisonous. So... <laughs> That's pretty cool. Now, let me move the fruit, toss this for a second. I will actually be fully back in a second, but that was our little intermission potato alert. And I'll be fully back in a moment while we chat about some random mathematical games and such, and maybe get a closer look at that absolutely awesome potato. Okay. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me in our extra combo class footage. Quick reminder for anybody stumbling by that this is, as usual on our live streams, pretty experimental and based around chatting and random topics I'm interested in. Whereas for a pure educational experience, make sure to tune into the combo class channel. Since it's a little confusing for some people, I might cut the From Combo class from this channel not too long from now. Maybe when we get to 200k, we'll consider Demotro well known enough. We're just going to cut the From Combo class. I mean, I want com I care more about uh I don't know which name I care more about being known. Cuz Combo class is my better project. But Demotro defines all of the backstory and whatever weird projects I try. So either of those names getting known in culture is okay. At some point, we might cut the From Combo class from this channel name. Just call it Demotro. That's what it says on the shorts anyway. Now they make a new handle thing. Now it just says at Demotro. So most people just see it as that anyway. So we're going to cut that off at some point and just call it the Demotro channel and the Combo Class channel. And we'll assume that the channels will continue expanding well enough like they have been that both of those names will slowly and steadily become known in culture. Now, Demotro is my goal for claiming a mononym. Now, true Combo Lords know that my birth name is actually Dimitri with three eyes. It's actually the name in the credits of the main combo class episodes. It says under Demotro what my full birth name is. But although I love my name, Dimitri is a great name, and Dimitri is the backstory to all of these strange personas I've found within myself, maybe even including ones like Damatra and others you haven't met yet. Well, Demotro 
is not only a fun nickname out of those, of a way of shifting the vowels of sorts, turning all the I's to O's, but also an attempt at a mononym, because if there's so many Dim Dimitris out there, maybe not in my culture, I've only met maybe four or five other Dimitris in my life in person, but if I was in Russia, I would have met a lot. So it's a common-ish name throughout the world, although spelled many ways. Not all of them have the three I thing that I have. It, it could be like D, and then either no letter, just like straight to the next consonant, or I or E, then M, then it can be like I or E, then TR, and then it can be like I or Y. There's a lot of ways to do it. So, that's a fun combinatorics episode. How many ways can you spell Dimitri? But Demotro, you ain't got any Demotros out there in the playing ground of pop culture. So I figured maybe Demotro will work to actually search up and just be like, uh, oh, you search Demotro, you get me. Even I've considered, I plan on writing books at some point, and I still haven't fully decided if when I write a like a book I'm really proud of that I've finished, which I have many half-finished ones of, but they, I still need to finish them. When I finish publishing a book I'm really proud of, if it's just going to say Demotro on it instead of uh, a full birth name on it or something. Um, and it is there is a lore behind the name. There is a re I've gone into it a while ago. I'll go into more of the lore of where the name came from in the past and in the future, but it does kind of work. I just Googled Demotro. Maybe it's catering to my results, but the first thing does seem to be this channel when you search Demotro, unless they're fully catering to me as a result. So you can try and as well. And then we get to random ones like me saying, hey, it's Demotro on the combo class subreddit. Which, yeah, if you use Reddit, let's get this one popping more. I haven't visited it in a minute. I need to go back on there. But I use Reddit more than the other social medias as far as consuming dumb, random people chatting and memes and such. So, yeah, let's get the combo class subreddit popping. There's also, I guess, my Instagram here. I guess let's look, take a stroll through that for a moment because technically this is one of the first results that comes up for me on Google, I guess. And I barely ever use Instagram, but it does contain at least one photo of something you haven't seen, which this last photo I put on here did not. Oh, it won't even let me look at the photos if I don't log in. Are you joking? It's absolutely ridiculous. Oh, I hate these corporations. Someday I'm going to hire somebody to put all of my shorts on Instagram because they need to see all my math shorts on there. But I'm going to be so annoyed doing that process between me and or someone I hire of uploading all my shorts onto the Instagram because I don't like other social media. I only like YouTube. I like guys. I have 50,000 followers on TikTok and I quit using it because I just don't care. I just don't like TikTok. It's just boring to me to have followers on there. I don't care. I want followers on YouTube. I love it here. But uh, like I've said, I like experimenting on other things as well because my diehard goal is not being an employee for someone on YouTube as, or not. And so there will be things that I don't put on YouTube because uh, to a degree, they're my employer. I don't want them to get mad at one of my channels. I make almost no money from YouTube, but... They give me the very little amount of money I have, along with my Patreon supporters. So I, I'm not going to like be that casual about copyright things or things like that on YouTube because I have to see it like a job if I want any money for food next month. But it's I that's why I might mess around on other channels or other platforms would be to not care about copyright as much. But I also want to hire someone to put the stuff on places like Instagram or Facebook 
if any fans have a bunch of extra time and think I would trust you and that if I chatted with you, I would gauge that I could trust you. Let me know if you want to help me run any Instagram or Facebook pages for Combo Class because I have like a billion shorts to repost on places like that that just the people who don't look at YouTube shorts and don't look at TikTok don't get to see all my shorts. So if there's going to be dumb stuff on Instagram and Facebook anyway, why not spam them with my cool stuff? Now, speaking of which, funny, I'm trying to pull open my Instagram. I'm trying to log in so I can show you these dumb photos. I hate these corporations. This is not at all a plug for any of those things. If I say anything cool or show their site, screw you, Instagram, for making me log in like this. this is super annoying. I just want to see my own photos. But I will say that uh, Instagram and Facebook have kind of gotten a little one up on Twitter recently. I do have to put my word in the pop culture debate of, I don't know if you guys have been tuned into this thing where uh, Facebook, which also owns Instagram now, has made a new attempt at replacing Twitter on a thread-based platform. And while... I don't know if I'll ever make an account on that or not. I uh, I don't have any Combo Class or Demotro Twitter account because I always thought that was not my way I wanted to release content was through like a, like I like text, but it's like a site that's based around text and then cuts you off at a certain length. It's like, guys, come on. If I want to write something in text, then I probably want to write something long. It's like maybe when I demand of people read something text-based I wrote instead of a video, it's something I really care about that I don't want to cut off in 140 freaking syllables. So less than syllables, characters or whatever. But I don't know what they cut it off at. I don't have an account there. They don't let me see uh, things on Twitter anymore. He stopped showing it to people, I guess. But... Uh, Elon Musk, who I kind of, a uh, pop culture rich guy figure, who I used to have some respect for as, to a degree, an entrepreneur, although over time I've seen a lot of that entrepreneurialism was truly based on inherited wealth. And uh, to a degree, somebody who pursues space travel always, you know, I thought was interesting. Like if you have extra money, trying to pursue space travel is kind of interesting. But uh, who I've grown to see is uh, quite a silly head, d d blown many billions of dollars on buying Twitter and then trashing it into the ground by making all these weird rules and uh strange attempts at the public liking him so sorry to anyone who's a huge fan of him i don't mind him he's not the worst of all the public figures of all time but i can't help but laugh if even somebody i dislike like mark zuckerberg does well enough to make another billionaire like get so pissy about their wealth it's like come on if you're a billionaire Donate it all, and then you have the right to be pissy about things or you have less than a billion dollars. When you have more than a billion dollars, just let people roast you and you live a better life than everyone else. If you can't take people roasting you, then le donate everything except for $100,000 and we'll leave you alone. Okay, so... Uh, I don't know how I'm going to log in to see the photos later... I'll do a stream at some point where I log in to show you some of these rare photos I wanted to show, including some flames and other stuff that I have on Instagram. So we'll say that despite Instagram uh, getting a fun laugh for being related to uh, Twitter doing crazy stuff, uh, they're not letting me show you guys the photos without logging in somehow. And I bet you that if I try and type a password, since I haven't logged in in a minute, it's going to say, let me text your phone or email to confirm something. So, no, 
the, these corporations are all out to get you. Now, of course, YouTube's like that to a degree. YouTube's also out to get you, but I love YouTube more than any of the others. I can't help it. Maybe it's just the one I've used throughout my life, but I like YouTube more than all the other ones. Those other ones are annoying. Now, let's see. Um, Random, somebody random said something about a business plan or something, and can I listen to Russian? That's coming a lot of different directions uh, to approach two different sides of that comment. One is that, no, I don't know any Russian. My name has a Russian sounding origin, but I am a tiny fraction Russian in my ancestry, but neither me nor my parents have been there. And I'm an equal amount Russian of ancestry, or a similar amount Russian in ancestry as I am Ukrainian and German and French and Polish and a variety of other things. So uh, I don't know Russian. I know almost nothing about Russian culture, even though the name Dmitry, my birth name, does sound quite Russian. Uh, no, I think my parents liked the three vowel thing because funny enough, my sibling may also have three vowels in their name. Now, somebody, the second half of the comment was about some business plan or something. Oh, anybody trying to come at me with some weird business plan? No, 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 no. You can come at me if you want to help combo class and then you will be part of whatever business plan gets generated. But I've had more than enough brands come at me trying to buy combo class, trying to make me sell their stuff during combo class. For more than enough money, I've turned down. People will give you money to sell your company that does well at a blink of an eye. I'm not going to sell combo class. I'm not going to give anybody else rights to this thing. This is my show. I get rights to this. If anyone wants to help combo class, they will trust me, like my friends who uh, do it, that I will pay them what I can and that I will also incorporate them in my plan for growth. Uh, if they don't want to trust me, that's okay. They do not have to help me because we do well enough just from our own here. And I do not want to hear of anybody's business plans. It always has an air to it of the business plan wants them to get some of the money and the this and the that. And then you know what it adds up to? They give you mildly better advice of a version advice you could have had. Mildly better copyright protection against copyright protection you could have had. And then you've lost 10% of your future income and willingness to grow or whatever. Oh, no, 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 no. No business proposals coming my way. Unless you, somebody who actually runs their own YouTube channel, who writes books, or who makes art can come at me with a business proposal. If you run a YouTube channel where you make videos, if you write books, if you're a computer programmer, if you have a skill you like, come at me with any business proposal. Maybe I'll jump on board with helping you, but I'm not gonna sell any of my thing. Eh, there's too many people trying to take everyone's thing these days. Now, Oh, it's the same person I was responding to. I don't know if this came out before or after the thing. They're asking if I have clocks or watches to sell. Bro, you're on the wrong channel. I hate money. Money's boring. This is not a money channel. I'm probably going to be rich someday by accident because I care about working hard. I know I'm not going to be rich because I'm trying to hustle stuff. Out of here with the hustling of that sort. I already have to hustle enough to tell people like, Hey folks, we have a Patreon. Hey, I'm going to launch a thing called memberships on this channel soon. That's enough hustling for the channel. It's, I want to be A, educational, B, entertaining. I'm not trying to hustle to my viewers 24-7. So, wrong spot for the hustlers. And trust me, I've hustled plenty in my day. 
I've been broke before. I have barely any money. I am not far from broke. So, uh, no, just find another channel to f sell your watches. I'm not selling these. I got these all for almost free. These are to teach. I'm not selling my teaching tools. Okay, actually, if somebody wanted to buy any of these, I would sell them. But I'm not going to, like, negotiate some crazy deal or something. That's not what this channel's about. Hello to everybody stopping by as well. Uh, sorry to um, come against that random comment. You're still welcome and love you and everything. Sometimes, you know, I roast the comments that you, if you comment, you got to be up for roasting. I'm up for roasting by making the content. I get roasted all day. Got to be up for roasting if you leave the comment. But uh, I will say capitalism is oversaturated in society and that I'm bored by money. I don't want to think about money. And my best days don't involve thinking about money. So, and the things that have made me money don't usually involve thinking about money. Some of the most money I've ever made in my life is from some random shorts and random videos I've made that did well on here. It's not a lot of money, but a few hundred dollars is more than I've ever made from a single thing before. And if I make a few hundred dollars, not from the average video, this stream is probably gonna make like $5, like literally less. In the stream might make like $2. But if I um, make a lot of money off a random video, to me, the videos that make that are not the ones I was trying to design around making money. It was the ones where I had something interesting to say. So, in any case, uh, sorry to at sounding extra roasty about that. I have, everyone wants to have a piece of every creative person's pie. If you're a creative person, you got to have some knives up and be on aware for like, the people who just want to sell you something or use, sell your thing to someone else and then own part of it. Because, oh, it has happened before. Trust me, I've turned down a lot of companies who want to just give me some bad offer to own some percent of combo class. No. If anyone wants me to collaborate, I will jump on your channel. I'll make f probably free appearances. Email me with the right offer. I'll probably show up on your channel for free. Probably. You can have a tiny channel. You can have a big channel. Email me. I will probably make a free appearance on your channel. But I'm not going to sell you part of my show. No. So, um, <laughs> somebody's asking again about the number negative seven. I don't know why you thought about the number negative seven so much. I've never heard something about negative seven in culture. N uh, seven is considered a lucky number. Maybe negative is considered unlucky and thus negative seven turns the luckiest number to the least n lucky number. I don't know the origin of that particular negative seven thing you're mentioning. I'll say that I think seven and negative seven are both not even worth talking about as much as other numbers. There are cooler numbers than seven and negative seven. So all sorts of great numbers out there. Those ones will get a shout out at time to time. Seven does some cool stuff. Negative seven does a few cool things as well. But a little overrated, those numbers. So they don't need quite as much discussion. Now, nothing that important about seven is weird because of base 10 outside being in base 10 it is a prime it, that's cool that's a good trait so it's a member of a few other sequences might be a catalon number let's see is seven a catalon number um no five is that was what i was thinking of seven's in some sequences it's a it's at least a prime and seven's not the most important or notable number outside that fact of being a low prime. Low primes are great. Low, the small prime number. Oh God, we got another type of bug. I said, I said that I was worried about the flies. 
That was a yellow jacket type thing. That's worse than a fly. Some people freak out about those, though. I don't get it when people freak out about a bee. Like, come on, folks, what's the worst that's going to happen? You never felt a bee sting amount of pain before. Maybe if you're worried you're going to be allergic or something, but I don't even know if wasps trigger that or not. I was I had a panic attack once when I got stung by a wasp nest and worried that I might be allergic to something in it because that was when I was in a rare phase. But there's a lot of people freak out whenever a bee comes in the classroom or into the yard or whatever. I'm having friends over in the yard. Sometimes honeybees come by the yard. Sometimes a yellow jacket. Yeah, they're more annoying than a honeybee. Sometimes they come around too. A little wasp thing. But I'm not going to banish them from the yard. They pollinate. They're great. They help the yard. If, they, if they're in the yard, welcome them. They make the plants grow. They're pollinators. So people got to stop freaking out about bees. The only time I've ever been stung by bees in my life was uh, when I was a child once. I kneeled down on the beach and I somehow kneeled on a bee and it stung me in the leg slash knee from kneeling down on it by accident. My fault. I'm a big human. I went down on it and made its defense mechanism. And then, I mean, obviously not on purpose. I just like went down and I was like, oh, what is that thing? And then I saw a little dead bee and I felt a stinger in me. But wasn't that bad. And then I got stung by a wasp chasing me when I was chased by a swarm of wasps with two of my friends, which is a story I've told one point in the stream before that I'll make an episode about someday. We'll visit the place the wasps stung me and make the episode about it in the actual location. But even when that happened, I somehow only got one sting, which is lucky. The nests can be bad, but all the rest of my life, I walk around my yard barefoot. I kneel around the place. There's bees all over and they dodge me because they're smart and they trust me. So it, you can like try and step on a bee almost. And if you're not doing it in an aggressive way, because they're smart enough to know if you're trying to get them, if you're just accidentally stepping somewhere, the bee will dodge you. They don't want to get stepped on. So... Bees are a little underrated. Now, that's not to say hornets, you know, those big old type of hornets, the type of waspy things that are like really big and scary. Okay, no, those things can stay out of the convo classroom. I do not want a hornet in here. But I mean like honeybees and like a tiny little wasp, those things are not as big of a deal. Unless like a hive, hives can be pretty bad once in a while. I got really lucky the time my friend stepped on one when I was right next to it because I only got stung once somehow, even though I ran away and felt them pecking at the back of my head and flying onto my arms and stuff. All right, so. Thank you to all the people joining me. What I think we're going to go on to in a minute is, let's see. Well, let me go through our comments first real quick and make sure that I've covered all this. Do, 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 do. Somebody notes, no need to roast me. My random fires will eventually roast me. There is a large fire that occurred recently where let me see. Um, let me pull up in a little clip of this one uh, fire that may have occurred recently. Well, I'm not the part of this is going to be in a main episode. So part of this is in the next episode, but I'm not sure exactly what parts of this are going to be in it. But me setting up this fire is still worth episode, it. So, so, oh no. So, what we're going to do is show a really prequel y thing, not to the main math of the next episode, but to the next, the main chaos of the next episode, 
where I'm going to cut off this clip as soon as the main episodes portion starts. And until then, I am going to show you the intro of a large fire that we had the other day here. Do not copy. And I think it clock a clock. large fire. Wait, why is it repeating me? If I, when I turn on the volume, it keeps like playing back layers of me. I hope that's not going through the actual audio. Okay, here we go. Yeah, like action. <laughs> All right, so that's our beginning of our next episode. Uh, not necessarily that shot, but what ensues right after that as we actually begin the episode. So, that one is, uh, gonna be a fun rarity as far as fire goes. Now, what I actually want to talk about for a moment, um, is not everyone's gonna be interested in this. This is a topic I briefly brought up the other day but is these thoughts I've had about analyzing the math of the magic cards that I looked into earlier today of this card game I used to be into as a child and seeing certain algorithms about certain decks and things like that. It's something that just in case people want to try, either you are interested in the game theory of the strange game or you just want to see how a game design and mathematical concepts would apply to a particular way you could design a game. I thought it would be interesting to look at one of the concepts I was trying to look at recently with that, that I was just thinking about last night as I was going to bed and such. And I wonder if I have any of the actual things around here. Um, let me try and grab something really quick as a drop and see if I have this. All right, sorry. Wanted to grab a prop. I wanted to see if I could grab the actual magic cards I had the other day. <clears throat> I didn't show them on stream by the other day. I mean, like 15 years ago. So um, the ones that I used to collect back in middle school when I was like 10 years old or 11 years old and stuff, 
which when I looked back at the dates, it, I was younger than I realized when I was really into this particular thing at first, because I looked up which sets had been coming out when I first studied this game or studied the game back in the day, less mathematically, more as a consumer or whatever or player of the game. But there were old sets, the ones I used to do. I also had some really old cards, not the type that are worth money, but I got them from a family friend who used to play who donated me some of the old ones. Not anything worth a bunch of money or whatever, but like the really old ones. And they show the beginning of a game design that was attempting to create this structure where you build a bunch of cards that can fit well together as a game that involves some degree of strategy. Now, you don't want it to necessarily be 100% strategy. You like a little luck, such as having a deck shuffled and not knowing what hand you'll draw. And without that, it's hard to prevent creating a deck that would always win. You know, um, if you don't, if you get to pick your opening hand, then whoever goes first will probably win. There's probably ways they could structure it. But if you have a degree of randomization and choices, like you're able to construct this deck of, let's assume that you're not a consumer, you're not into these pieces of cardboard and plastic, but you had an infinite access to them, and that you're making a deck in some digital or real format, or with a fake thing. People make what's called proxy cards that I don't have anything against. You know, screw the company trying to be anything against that. Make whatever fake version of the card you want. It's, they, I don't even, they charge too much for the normal card. I don't know. But if, let's say you had an infinite amount of fake versions you were allowed to play with of any of the cards or whatever. So, with that, what is the deck that will win the most amount of time? Well, it's enough of a game that it's like almost a tournament sport that you'll like win money if you actually can make the best deck in a given format. But the formats shift of which cards they allow. They'll say you're allowed this set at a time or whatever, or you're allowed everything up to here with these cards banned or whatever. And I'm very interested in the overall game idea of even if you had every card ever allowed under certain formats, or if you had certain cards banned if needed, what would be the percent chance that a deck could win on right off the bat on the, their first turn without changing anything? There are certain things that can even trigger what's called an infinite combo, uh, which is the funny thing about it is that, and yes, infinite combo, obviously something that I'll like, you know, combo class. Talk about infinity sometimes, infinite combo. We got to like something called that. But yes, I liked this thing called inf infinite combos as well as a kid where you would try and trigger two cards to go up to what I now consider, now that I know more about math, an arbitrarily large combo. In fact, if you hit an infinite combo that you cannot stop, that must go infinite, then the game is a draw. It's actually this un, not as well-known rule that once in a while card reactions cause an infinite loop that cannot be stopped by another player's card or uh, ability to react to something that cause it to be a tie if there's an infinite thing. And that really the ones that I considered an infinite loop as a kid when playing the game are an arbitrarily large loop. A loop that could be continued infinitely, but that you're not allowed to say the number infinite for how much you do it for. You must pick an arbitrarily large number for the amount of times you say, do a certain output. It's almost like an equation that surpasses a perpetual motion machine where, let's say I want 2x to equal 3x. Well, that's going to be pretty hard with numbers other than zero in math, but in a game, let's say I want to be able to make a perpetual motion machine of sorts where an input grows. Now, by perpetual motion machine, I mean the physics idea that to have something that continues perpetual motion and goes back to the top without any secret... Ma if you see a video of somebody, something that loops around infinite times, it is either a staged video you know, a white lie based on how it's edited or is, 
some sort of magnet or something inside the device because you can't have perpetual motion because to get back to the top requires overcoming some gravity. And due to conservation of mass and energy and certain things like that, you cannot have fallen and gained energy without taking away from another source and gotten back where you were apart from the gravity with just as much energy and momentum and such as where you were before at the same spot as you were before, like back from where gravity had put you without having taken away from some source like a battery or a magnet or something. So a perpetual motion machine on its own is impossible. And it's something that old people, I believe maybe Newton may have investigated this. Many old people of that time, the old classic scientists and such investigated. Can we make one? And they can't, but it's in a game. Sometimes you can create a perpetual motion machine that sort of re-triggers itself and even surpass that to the point of where an input gives you a further output, letting you go arbitrarily large. So for example, if I had a, a card that lets me get some sort of energy based thing and then I had a thing that could, for less than that amount of energy, reset that card so it could use its ability again. Then I could continue the loop, like feeding into itself and getting more of that sort of energy each time. And there are ways to do that in that game of magic in terms of you can gain infinite life, which is like protection against stuff, or infinite damage to the opponent, which could kill them, or infinite amount of a creature, which is a sort of card, or things along those lines. But really, they're not infinite combos. They're arbitrarily large combos, because you cannot say the number infinity as your answer to one of the things in the game. And if you are forced to go to infinite, the game is a draw, something not everyone realizes. So what I was interested in is what are certain decks that have certain percent chances of hitting an infinite combo, not only just as a game thing, but as their first turn. Now, first of all, the reason I brought out these is these are not magic cards I used to have. These are old cards I designed as a kid. These were inspired by every sort of card game around the block of my own creations. There are a lot of these and for example, one that I that's on top, I think, because I showed it last time. It, or maybe it wasn't even on top, but I don't know. The new manager of Reek, math class. Hey, see, I was making cards talking about math class back in the day. Who knew? And this is worth 120 points. Hey! Oh, my God. So, okay, so who, earlier somebody was talking all about how cool 120 was in this stream we talked all, all about how cool 120 was you want some proof baby the card i made as a kid 120 math class the new manager it was called reek it's probably part, part of the lore um one of the other ones i showed last time is this green staff but we have hundreds and billions of these cards i made as a kid Oh, okay, on all sorts of different backs and backgrounds and stuff. And there are even different sorts of games. This one's called Computer One. The passcode is in this room. Out of order. Lose keys or quit. Or loose keys. I don't know. This one's called Objects. What is this? But then this one's more like a magic card. This one's called Ambassador Laquatus. And he's an Emperor Liquids, and he's a creature liquid, and he has Trample and Haste. This is obviously inspired by magic cards. Those are abilities they used. And then you got all sorts of weird playing cards that I would make throughout my life. And when I was very young, first, the idea I thought is, oh, you can just put a number on them. And the number is how powerful the card is. And I don't have, okay, those are an older generation of cards. I don't have those right here. Those are actually the rarest. I actually have cards that I need to get that generation. It's not within these that I made when I was like four. But 
the, those would just have a number on them. They were entirely just a point that the card was worth. And I bet some of these were still trickle overs from that era that would have had just a point as their structure or whatever. And so the old cards would be like this and then say like a number. And the, then I realized as a game theory perspective, I was like, the, this game I developed is entirely luck. Whoever draws the better, higher ones will do better. Even if I have you draw a hand and play some, if they're just numbers, it's at its best, just a bluffing game. And it's not going to have too much strategy. Oh, here's an example. This one's seven. Super seven. This one uses stickers. This one's not as home drawn, but I have, most of them I drew. Now, as I went forward studying, first I studied like my friends had Pokemon cards and I didn't know what they did as far as gameplay, but I would, here's another example of just like a points one. This is called Sunny and it has 110 points. But as I got further into understanding the ways in which you might want to use strategy in a game like that and in which you don't just want points. You need cards to do different things that make you want to play them at different times. Well, I became more inspired by that game called Magic. And a lot of these cards are close. They range between things that I came up with that are sort of similar to it. Like this guy is called Nicro and he's a warrior legend and he has two time regenerate and he has three stats that I don't remember what they mean. He has a four on each side and a 10 in the middle. So these are not how magic works, ranging to ones that were almost like uh, little rip offs. Oh, but this might've been one of the ones I made when I was really little. This is an example of like the first ones that before I realized how you needed to make gameplay, I'm like, this guy's worth three. His name's Sisun and his name is worth three. It's pretty dope, isn't he? I like Sisun. So now <laughs> we'll go through all these cards in a ridiculous live stream someday. But the point as an intro was that over time, I did really appreciate that game of magic as having these strange combos it could develop while maintaining a certain amount of structure to its gameplay. And the way I wanted to test that structure, especially now when I was rethinking about this yesterday, was what is a deck I could develop? If I played by certain restrictions, for example, your deck needs a minimum amount of cards, your deck uh, typically the structure began as 40 as a minimum, 60 became the main minimum for what a deck is considered to be. It's also a different format they made up called Commander that it does a different thing, but uh, uh, we're not talking about the thing called Commander, really. We're talking about the 60-card decks. And with those, you also are only allowed, unless a card says on it that you are allowed any amount of it in the deck. There are a few cards that say you can put more of them in your deck. Typically, you are allowed up to four of each card in your deck. And so with those restrictions, I was thinking last night of trying to figure out with some decks that I could make that would be really overpowered if no cards were banned. But following those rules, I need 60 cards in my deck. I need a, a maximum four of each card and then play by all the other rules as well. What is the percent chance I could design a deck that would win on the first turn before, unless the opponent has a very rare sort of card in their hand, they can't stop you without them having a turn yet. And so even if they have those, we could factor that when I do enough math, we could factor into the deck how many of your own counter spells you could have to combat an opponent having that. Now, even at its simplest, it became a very complicated mathematical issue to look at 
I have a 60 card deck. Some of the cards I have four copies of, some of them I don't. Some I have like one, two or three copies of. What is the chance of drawing a given seven card hand? Off the bat is really complicated. It relates to hypergeometric distributions. It's not a simple question of with that many different types of population within a meta population, the chance of drawing a certain combination of them. So to simplify it, I thought maybe we can design a deck that's overpowered, but in a simple enough way that we can do the math about it. So like, for example, our goal with a deck that we would design where we're still allowed up to four of any card they've made and we're not going to ban any cards. We'll let ourselves have up to four of any card they've made. There's this one restriction. They've made these things called the unsets that are like joke cards. We're not allowed to use any joke cards and we're not allowed to assume any die rolls or anything like that because those could go either way. We need things that are guaranteed to go a certain way. We also, to simplify it, although this isn't necessary for the math, to even approach the math, the way I thought we might have to do it to start is assume we're not drawing stuff and that the cards in our hand are what wins the game, or that we draw seven cards at the beginning and that those seven cards can combine to win the game. There are certainly seven card combinations that can combine to win the game, but designing a deck so that you're not stuck with some terrible combination of some of those. A, a deck, not even the goal of trying to win against another deck for what we're talking about, but the goal of what's the highest percent chance you can have to win on your first turn, assuming they don't have some strange reaction to it from their hand. Now, Sometimes described as going against a goldfish player, a player who is like just blank and not really doing anything that as if they don't don't have any strange way of responding, which typically they won't on their first turn or on their zeroth turn if you go first. Means if you can go if you can win on your first turn, you're usually good to go. Now, what's the percentage we can get on that? Now, I designed some simple decks that I thought would do really good on that, but it's really hard to do the math on them of as far as the likelihood of drawing certain things. It's like when we were trying to analyze the chance of rolling six dice in different combinations, by the time we looked, we were like, what could we have gotten for the first die? Okay, here's what I could get for that. Okay, now here's... Is he going to get a nut? Maybe you took a nut. But uh, after the first, uh, how many things can the first thing be? The amount of things the second thing could be expanded drastically. And from there, the third and fourth and fifth expanded drastically. And it gets even crazier if you're imagining cards with multiple copies in your hand, which is likely what you're going to want for one of those things. Because you, in most of these decks of the format we're looking at, you would have a few different cards as well playing together. And even to win on the first turn, you need to dedicate a lot of your resources of cards of generating the right resources or setup to whatever combo you want to pull off. And for example, um, let me give just a quick example of what I mean if I describe a type of card right here. So the most basic type is this thing called a land which is okay we're just going to try and search for whatever it needs to be so if we look up forest is the name of one of the simple types of land this creates like a green energy so you can have these cards called lands that create energy you can have these things called creatures that 
have a power and toughness that sort of are how much they can attack for and how much they can be attacked by without dying. And then they have like a cost at the top of how much of these land type resources creating this resource called mana to put into them. Now, when I started, these cards were way simpler. These cards looked like this. These cards are, I mean, not all of them. Some of them were really long. Some of them had really complicated effects. But now they put like these, they assume everyone knows all these names, They're like Vanishing Three. This one they describe. But imagine some of the cards are just like Vanishing Three. So like, yeah, you better know what that means. So they're getting a little heavy with uh, the keywords and stuff and the power levels of stuff as well. But these cards are very interesting in that they've made many thousands of them. And I still am unable to do the math on how high of a percent could you achieve of a deck always winning on the first turn, even if you were allowed every card ever with nothing banned. There's no automatic setup for your deck that guarantees a certain thing out of it. Now, if you can design a given starting hand, I will say it only takes, if you don't ban any cards, three cards. There's a few ways to do it three cards to win the game. So they've gotten to glitches like that, which they didn't enjoy. In fact, there's what you could consider a two card combo if you have them in play at the same time. But I mean three cards counting this really expensive card called Black Lotus they made back in the day that generates too much of that mana land resource. So even having to generate that resource, you can uh, use this old card called Black Lotus is so expensive. This is why, like, if I ever say that I have old cards, people instantly are like, oh, do you have ones that can I, I can sell? Do you have cards I can sell? It's like, dude, chill out. No, I don't have, like, a freaking Black Lotus or something. They've heard the name of this card being worth a lot because this is a really overpowered card they printed near the beginning that they realize sensibly they should stop making available to the players. It's like way too powered up. So they banned it from the tournaments too, but like to own one is look at this, look at, no, no, never pay that for a piece of cardboard and plastic folks. Do not pay that amount for a piece of cardboard and plastic. Now, those cards, if you're allowed to use those in your deck, you could get down to as little as three cards that could win the game. But it's very complicated to design a deck that uses requiring 40 or 60 cards with a maximum of four of each card, which is the typical formats, to have the greatest likelihood of winning. You want other cards that can say, search your deck for another card, pull it up very well. You need pieces of your combo, but you don't want to be screwed if they're stuck in your hand or deck or the wrong place. Cause you could draw any seven of your thing. And you need a, the right like mana land resources as well as other things. And I came out with a deck that sometime when somebody who knows a lot about this game, who also knows a lot about math, wants to talk to me about, wants to calculate a lot of odds for me somehow. I came out with a few decks that are simple enough that I just want to calculate the odds that they're opening hand. They have nothing that makes you draw a card. They, they do have things that let you search your library, but those are assumed to mean you can search for whatever card you want. They have nothing related to drawing or dice rolls that would need more than seven cards established as your opening hand. And, and you can say there's these things in my deck if the card lets you search for an exact sort of a thing. Now, with those, I want to know the exact odds that different decks of different sizes could win. And I made some that are simple enough like that, that while they're not the best deck you could make, they don't have any draw effects or things like that. And they simply, we could calculate the odds of it winning from the opening hand based, squirrel. 
Oh, he went up in the tree. Yeah. Hi. Hey. What's up? <laughs> Hi. You want a nut? I put your nuts over there, mister. He wants a nut. Hey. Here's a nut. I'll, I'll repoint the camera if it goes right there. Uh, we'll see. Anyway, that was a good squirrel cameo. That fella was just chilling on the tree. Now, um, let's see. What I was noting is that I want to calculate the odds on the simplest way because it's already really complicated combinatorics to calculate what you're going to draw with a given hand from a deck. It, or what the odds of any given draw when you have up to four of each card. The simple ones we're going to do will use maybe four of each card exactly. And we'll use things that don't require drawing and such. So that we can see with an opening hand of seven cards what the likelihood they'll win the game is. So... I designed some decks that can do that pretty insanely powerfully. And I think, of course, there are tournaments where people would beat me if because I haven't studied this in a long time. But I designed some decks for just out of boredom in the last night or two that I think would, if you didn't have any cards restricted, you played just up to four of each card, would a lot of the time win on their first turn. So, I, but I don't know if it's more or less than half the time. That's how wide the margin for error and how complicated the thing is. I know that they have a good chance of winning their first time, but I don't know if the decks I've designed are more than half the time they do it on their first turn. It's really hard to calculate that. So, what we have to do is test them. We need to get, I'm not going to buy these cards. These cards probably cost a crazy amount of money. We'll draw them on business cards like this, baby. And then we're going to uh, test it. We'll just like shuffle the deck 50 times and see how many times it wins on its first turn. Now, that was the one thing I was into recently as far as those. But there's many things I thought about in the past like week recently ish when I first stumbled back into this topic in my head that also involve not just ways you could win on the first turn and ways in which an infinite combo could glitch or not in the right or wrong way but other interesting things about the mechanisms ways in which it related to other combinatoric traits like Pascal's triangle ways in which it related to uh, a game that is technically Turing complete, meaning that it can essentially simulate whatever a binary computer can do and other crazy things about it. Now, we're going to have to compile some data and knowledge about that one I mentioned about the Turing completeness about it at some point because it's very wild that there's the right setup of cards that if you play them just based on the rules of magic will generate a Turing tape state of a computer-like thing, a binary state of a thing that you can measure in terms of building it into... Being able to copy anything a binary computer can do. So, those are some random ones we're going to do. One of the nearer future ones I'll do is I'll just show what I meant about how it relates to Pascal's triangle. I'll do that one in the nearer future. And then later, we may do some other concepts about that that will relate to not only how it reminds me of equations you create that surpass perpetual motion to generate an infinite or arbitrarily large amount of something. And 
as well to the game theory mechanic of how you design or non-design paradoxical traits or how you avoid having to rewrite many cards. They don't want to make many cards that they later change what it did. They don't want to make a card that what was printed on the card, it later they say it can't do that in a tournament. And so, even though many cards are banned from different formats, they want cards when allowed to do what they did. But sometimes... Hi. Yeah, I put out some nuts for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man, I put out some nuts for you. Oh, my God. I really hope you can see that well. He is just hanging out there. Oh, that's so cool. He's just hanging out and eating my nuts. Oh my god. Hey, you guys are so nice. I put more. You can get more nuts. I put a lot of them. Yeah, there's more nuts. Yeah, there's definitely some more you can find. Oh yeah. That's a nut right there too. How are you going to get it? Sometimes you knock over a clock here. It's okay. That's okay. Oh, you can still get the nut. There's some easier to reach ones too. Yeah, that one's easier to get. You are the friendliest squirrel yet. Gone. That was the most friendly squirrel of all time. I bet it'll come back in a minute. That was so cool. I hope that camera was pointing the right direction for most of that. That was so cool. Okay, I love our squirrel friends who give us our cool little background nature to inspire all of this stuff. Anyway, Later, we'll make some episodes returning to that concept about how card games such as Magic the Gathering could relate to game theory as well as to almost equation-like ways of viewing interactions between things. But that distracted me for sure, that awesome squirrel cameo. I want to get him more nuts. Where's the nuts I put out for him? I want to make sure he knows they're here. Hey, Mister. Alright, I need to look through that footage later. I feel like, oh, fuck. I feel like that was some of the best squirrel footage in a minute. Okay, so. Thank you all for joining us for the squirrel chaos and so on. In any case, um, that was a little random excursion about how we will, for better or for worse, for people's uh, desires, sometimes work in the math of random hobbies that I happen to end up into in a given month. And for some reason, I flashed back on the old idea of designing card games that work well together. And of course, 
Uh, I don't want people to have to buy plastic things. Someday what we'll do is we'll design a better one. We'll design something of what we learn from a game like Magic the Gathering as far as a game that we could implement into a normal 52 card deck. For example, with a 52 card deck, what are the simplest set of rules you could apply to cards where you would have each player, you know, say take one player's the reds, one's the blacks, or something, you each have a 26 card deck. What is the most complicated strategy you can have without having overly complicated rules? So that's something I've always been interested in. Similarly with board games, what is in between? So for example, the question there is almost what is in between Go Fish, the card game that's like basically nothing or like War or one of those card games that's basically nothing and Magic cards. Similarly, what is between Chess and Checkers? So I think there could be a simpler version of Chess that could involve simpler rules, less amount of different pieces, and still have an amount of strategy that was incalculatable. Some would say I'm referring to the game Go, which uh, I need to look more into that, but is a historic game that apparently is in some ways simpler, yet at least as complicated as chess. So, Games like that, I'm quite interested in the theory of. What is the simplest set of rules you could develop in a game that is solvable, but beyond the comprehension of a human to solve, to the degree to which it implies strategy to our human brains, where an unsolved thing feels creative to tap into? Now, that was a little tangent on that. That squirrel really distracted me, but we'll wrap up from the card stuff now. We'll look at more of this card stuff another day as we get into some actual specifics about like, here's an example of the infinite thing I'm talking about or whatever, or here's an example of we're gonna try and calculate this deck or whatever. But that's a random thing I was fiddling around with in the past few days. Won't show up in this month's Combo Class episodes because those ones, we already are mostly done filming. I've been filming my last episode, next episode about cubes and such, and one about snack breaks and one about spheres, which may sound sort of similar to the other topics, and it is in a way a merger of algebra and geometry, where one of the episodes I also started filming for relates to spherical things in various dimensions. In any case, I think I'm going to wrap up our stream relatively soon. If anyone has any further remaining questions, feel free to let me know. But in general, we'll have some more fun stuff coming tomorrow. I'll be filming again tomorrow and might put out some sort of little bonus video on the channel then. And I'll definitely have the next sort of second part to the last main combo class episode. The next episode being hopefully standalone, but also to a degree, a second part to the last one coming out this weekend sometime. And in between them, some more random fun stuff. I have a lot of fun bonus videos that some are even partially filmed and edited and others I just have planned and ready to go. They'll be coming out in the not too distant future. But until then, I hope you all have a magnificent day. Remember to appreciate your wildlife, your numbers, any possible aliens who may be watching you on some strange telescope, and appreciate all of your neighbors and even your enemies. Love you all, and I will see you in the next one.